Thank you so much, and it's great being here at this virtual edition of the Conference of Paris, organized by the International Economic Forum of the Americas. I'm very happy to be here with you virtually, of course, and we are going into the plenary session number seven, the importance of purpose, a more human and responsible capitalism. This is what we're going to be discussing over the next almost an hour with our distinguished speakers, and it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce them to you right now. On the panel with us today for this session, we have Anne Finukin, Bank of America Vice Chairman and Chair of Bank of America Europe, Claire Wayson, Interim CEO Angie, Dino Cocard, CEO at Le Grand, and Stefano Piscina, Executive Vice Chairman and CEO Walgreens Boots Alliance. Welcome to this panel. Great to have you here to be discussing this very important topic during this seventh plenary session of the Conference of Paris. Ms. Funikin, let me start with you. Uh, you have been leading the company's environmental, social and governance strategy for years now. Are you seeing an increased focus and even collaboration within the private sector in addressing major environmental and social issues when we are talking, of course, about the importance of purpose? Uh, well, hello. Thank you, Sasha, and uh, good day to my fe fellow panelists. It's nice to be with you. Um, yes, we certainly are. I think there are a number of factors uh, to be considered here. First of all, there is a growing demand from institutional investors, from governments, from employees, from customers. I think there is a growing uh, body of work from uh, research that indicates the importance of ESG uh, really on very basic things, volatility, uh, reduction of bankruptcy, and, and better results. So those sort of fundamental pieces are important. And if we just look at the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that so many countries, 193 countries, have signed on to, it's, uh, it's assumed that it would take about $6 trillion a year to deal with these. And uh, no amount of philanthropy or government intervention is going to uh, close that gap. So it takes the business community to, to participate in it. And uh, when you look at the assets that might be available to address them, uh, looking at the trillions of dollars in asset management, wealth management, insurance companies, and banks alone, you can see that if we could just put part of our uh, portfolios toward addressing uh, the sustainable development goals, real action and real movement could happen. Now, I will say that uh, I think you see a lot of movement already, whether it's in the US, the Business Roundtable, or internationally, the International Business Council. All of us, many of us anyway, have, have agreed to, have signed on and enthusiastically embraced the idea of not only uh, making money, if you will, but to do the right thing at the same time, to take a holistic look at uh, our business proposition, keeping in mind that in order to keep your customers, to keep your employees, and to maintain good relationships with institutional investors, you have to show that you're a citizen of the world as well as a good business company. And frankly, even in our own case, we've seen real progress here. Uh, we have even in these times of the pandemic, uh, enjoyed uh, strong client and customer and, and employee satisfaction. We see that from many of our portfolio companies. I just think that you're seeing a huge movement. Now, I'd like to just make one other uh, mention, and that's with the International Business Council. The need for metrics measurement has grown substantially, but uh, it's an alphabet soup, as we all know, of uh, rating agencies, standard setters, and, and government uh, protocols. And so the International Business Council has set forth, uh, full disclosure, our chairman and CEO, Brian Moynihan, cheers this, along with Klaus Schwab of the um, World Economic Forum, to try to create a framework for all companies to use in order that we might be able to uh, describe in a uh, discernible, understandable way the kinds of movements companies need to make to uh, 
to be included in good ESG standards, to be seen as a good uh, company around the um, sustainable development goals and more broadly around environmental, social and governance guidance. Thank you so much, Anne Finnick, and Bank of America Vice Chairman and Chair of Bank of America Europe. And I think the phrase of not only making money, but also doing the right thing is totally going into the hashtags category for the panel. Uh, on, speaking of that, I got a question to Claire Weiss and Interim CEO at Angie, something that Ms. Finnick mentioned also there. We are going to, I'm going to ask you about an environmental agenda and green efforts. According to the European Union, investment in renewable energy could create three times as many jobs as investing in fossil fuels. What are Angie's efforts when it comes to decarbonization and transitioning the green economy as an important step towards more responsible capitalism? Hello, 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 Sasha. Hello, good afternoon, good morning to to all uh, all panelists and listeners. Um, uh, indeed, uh, I would like to pick up things where Anne left them. Uh, making money at the same time uh, doing what's right is uh, is very much of the essence for an energy company like Engie. Uh, as you know, we are present on both sides of the Atlantic, so very happy to be here here today. Uh, and as an energy company, we had to face a simple issue. To become sustainable, we need to embrace energy transition. And that's what we did uh, several years ago. Uh, just, just a figure, between 2015 and now, we have divided by two our greenhouse gas emissions, and we plan to divide them by two again by 2030. Uh, another way to say it, uh, we are an energy company that's certified SBT, uh, an energy company that's compatible with the Paris Agreement. Uh, so what is our role uh, as an energy company? Well, it's twofold. When you have in mind energy transition, uh, you have in mind two things. You have in mind the decrease in consumption of energy, and that's the first way to get uh, to, to limit climate change. And the second way is to green energies. And that's exactly what we're doing. We're helping companies, we're helping businesses, we're helping universities in the US in particular, not only. Uh, we're help, helping households green, reduce their consumption and green their energy consumption. Uh, that's, of course, as an energy company, energy transition has to be part of a sustainable model and it's also part of our purpose. So moving to a wider uh, wider, wider lens, if I may say, uh, we as a company have adopted a purpose, and the purpose is exactly what Anne was saying before. It's to, to make compatible, to reconcile economic performance with being, having a positive impact on the people and on the planet. And for this, we provide services and energy that goes towards energy transition. So sustainability vis-a-vis -vis the planet, so efficient, energy efficiency, greening energy, that's one, but broader, uh, broader uh, contribution to the people. And to the people in a time of pandemics means a lot. It meant for our employees, of course, protecting them. It meant uh, being sure that they were insured socially. But it also means to broader communities being, being a good citizen, uh, acting as a responsible company. And I very much believe as uh, uh, in my role at Engie, but also in, uh, in my life as a citizen, I very much be believe that if we want to build sustainable models, uh, be it for companies, be it for countries, we need to embrace the energy transition and we need to make sure we reconcile our contribution to economic performance with our impact on the planet and on the people. So very happy uh, that this is part of our purpose and very convinced that that's the reason why, by the way, our people wake up every day uh, and that's the reason why I wake up every day. And maybe a last, last point, uh, since we have divided by two our carbon emissions uh, since 2015, we have seen the number of applicants to NG being multiplied by three. So that tells you something about the fact that a sustainable business model is also a way to be attractive 
and to attract the best talents is the best way to be sustainable. And uh, attracting people and attracting interest from all sides in this case, of course. Uh, Benoît Bagarcio of Le Grand, um, when it comes to positive impact on planet and on people, what's very important, of course, is the social aspect. And with you've got over 38,000 employees worldwide. How does Le Grand factor in social aspect, diversity and inclusion on its path towards more responsible capitalism? Well, um, hello, Sasha. G glad to be with you today. By the way, 38,000, it's not that much compared to my uh, colleagues from NG or from, from Bank of America. Well, we are taking vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, social topics um, the same approach as with the other uh, ESG topics. In other words, um, we listen to, shareholder, to stakeholders and shareholders. We draft roadmaps. And actually, it's currently our fourth roadmap. We take public objectives and we report every year on those objectives. So this is true, also, of course, for diversity topics. For example, uh, we, we have taken uh, uh, targets as far as uh, the proportion of women in our uh, management team was concerned. But we are, also, of course, taking uh, public objectives as far as uh, CO2 uh, uh, emission re reduction is concerned, as far as uh, uh, the waste uh, which is going to be recycled in terms of uh, uh, compliance training, in terms of reduction of uh, accidents in the workforce, and so on and so forth. And once those objectives are, are, are public, and, 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 and again, we are reporting every year on those targets, we include those ESG targets into the remuneration of our people. When you are a country manager at Le Grand, at least 10% of your bonus and one-third of your long-term incentive plan depends on the achievement on our CSR and our ESG roadmap. So a very practical um, uh, and result-oriented uh, approach. Uh, and this framework has been um, uh, here for more than 15 years. So this is not something new at Le Grand. So for us, uh, adding to this framework uh, purpose, and this is an exercise which we did with our board uh, last year, uh, wasn't such a difficult exercise because actually the purpose was more making explicit something which was implicit at Le Grand. And we already had this framework of taking public targets and, and reporting regularly on the way we were achieving them. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm going to move to Stefano Piscina, Executive Vice Chairman and CEO at Walgreens Boots Alliance. Mr. Piscina, uh, of course, the past few months have proven and added even more importance to to this to the importance of purpose. You're a global leader in retail and wholesale pharmacy. How has the current pandemic and the COVID-19 crisis taken the company's strategy and purpose to another dimension? Well, uh, as you said, we are uh, a company active uh, in healthcare, so we were uh, really fully engaged uh, in this uh, pandemic. And uh, since the very outbreak of the pandemic, uh, we have worked closely with the government, with the manufacturer, with the distributors, uh, and uh, with our, all the other uh, industry leaders uh, to ensure access uh, to essential medicines and products. And we have tried to help uh, accelerate the availability of COVID tests in the US, in the UK, in other, in other countries. And uh, we have tried to be a safe and trusted source of information and resources. And of course, our people had a very, very important part uh, in it. And even during the most severe lockdowns, uh, we ensured fully continuity and kept all our business open our 21,000 pharmacies around the world never stopped supporting patient needs, both in stores and via our digital channels. And our pharmaceutical sale business, our distribution business, through 425 distribution centers in 20 countries, ensured constant supplies and critical services to more than 250,000 pharmacies, doctors, health centers, and hospitals. 
We provide, of course, uh, a public service uh, and uh, World in Boots Ally, deeply committed to supporting national healthcare system across the world. In reality, we have been uh, at the forefront uh, uh, of this uh, uh, pandemic since the early days uh, in the Hubei uh, province in, uh, in China. Uh, because we have, to, uh, together with our partner, Sinopharm, we have a significant retail uh, pharmacy chains, what uh, are in China, with over 7.5 thousand stores in the country. And uh, we have also several, several stores in, uh, in Huan, the city where the outbreak, uh, outbreak started from. And uh, so uh, we have... Uh, to uh, face uh, since the very beginning the uh, extremely tough containment measures imposed by the Chinese government. And after we uh, observed the virus spreading in Europe and in the US, uh, where unfortunately we have to say we saw division and fragmentation prevailing over cooperation, unfortunately. And across all these different landscapes, both our pharmacies and pharmaceutical sale and distribution activities uh, play a key role as essential public service in their community. Building on our global expertise, uh, we have uh, tried to ensure a swift and consistent response uh, across our market. And uh, our people were really, really very important uh, in doing this. Remember that uh, uh, we have 450,000 people and uh, many, many of them are healthcare operators, pharmacists or, or so. And uh, we have been uh, really while most of the countries were uh, uh, shut down, more of the stores were shut down, our pharmacies were open. And our pharmacists were there every day trying to help people. Walgreens uh, has partnered closely since the onset of the pandemic with the U.S. administration to provide access uh, to COVID-19 testing. And so far, we have completed about, in the U.S., about uh, two, bi- 2 million COVID tests uh, uh, across uh, all the U.S. And the White House has chosen us as a strategic partner in the early days of the emergency. And we will remain for sure uh, at uh, their side with them uh, in the fight against the virus for a long, as long as needed. Uh, World is, uh, it's already working with the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, the U.S., and the administration as part of the Operation Warp Speed to help administer uh, COVID-19 vaccines once available, to high priority groups, including long-term care facility residents and staff. Ensuring access uh, to COVID-19 vaccines once approved and available will be critical to saving lives and helping uh, uh, the US recover from the pandemic. Similar in the UK, uh, Boots was called by the government to support the NHS by setting up and resourcing new drive through COVID-19 testing stations for the NHS staff. Until now, uh, we have activated uh, a little less than 200 sites uh, in the country, all over the country, and completed uh, around uh, one and a half million of tests. And we are ready to play a key role also in COVID max vaccination. Let me ask you this, um, playing the significant role, you're, there's also a significant impact of the companies, of course, like yours on the economy and society. Sustainability criteria increasingly influencing financial investment decisions. Has the conversation on sustainability changed since the pandemic? Well, I have to say that uh, for sure there has been uh, for sure, there has been uh, a, a, I would say, um, a, a kind of uh, 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 renewed energy uh, to the conversation around the stakeholder capitalism uh, and also uh, about the ESG reporting. 
Uh, I have to say that in this period, uh, probably the climate change has been uh, less uh, uh, evident uh, in the, uh, but uh, of course uh, the public health uh, was really the biggest uh, challenge. Uh, and uh, what another important uh, uh, feature uh, has been uh, the social unrest because uh, uh, the economic inequalities, uh, the racial injustice uh, have been exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic. And so uh, there has been uh, a stronger demand for a comprehensive, uh, globally accepted corporate, corporate, corporate reporting system. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, I would say that uh, if anything, uh, the world was already going, uh, the corporate world, uh, world was already going in that direction because uh, uh, as uh, uh, Anne has uh, uh, told us uh, all, uh, um, all uh, the, big, uh, the big organization uh, have really um, pushed in these directions uh, and uh, uh, I want uh, I want to uh, uh, to also to uh, say that uh, business round table uh, where uh, we had uh, uh, tried to redefine what we were say uh, calling the purpose of a corporation uh, to promote to promote an economy that serves all Americans so uh, the companies are uh, understanding uh, uh, that uh, to promote uh, long-term value, we have to put the customer first. We have to invest in our employees and we have uh, to, uh, to invest in the communities where we operate. And this is for sure uh, uh, being uh, uh, more evident in this period. Uh, the only thing that I would say is that while the, all the, uh, the companies, the corporates uh, are really trying uh, to, uh, uh, to do as much as they can uh, and even uh, to give them some standards and to, uh, uh, and to, uh, uh, to give a kind of uh, ESG rating, uh, there are not clear rules, there are not clear definitions. And this is something that, uh, of course, uh, uh, will be important in future. Otherwise, uh, we cannot compare uh, what the companies are doing uh, and the companies cannot compare themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis a standard. Thank you very much. Claire Waits and Interim CEO Angie, let me pick up that line and just ask you exactly on what Mr. Pessina just said on renewed energy over for this conversation of more human and responsible capitalism. Do you feel this renewed energy and how, how has it, if it has, intensified? So, uh, renewed energy, uh, yes, certainly, in a, in a broad sense, like uh, Stefano was just, uh, was just saying. I think this COVID crisis really shows us how interdependent we are from each other and also shows us a number of issues that the world has to tackle and to tackle urgently. Uh, and Stefano was mentioning a few of them. Uh, clearly, uh, the issue of inequality is one. Clearly, the issue of being able to provide health to everybody is, is a big issue, and, and as, as shown in the COVID crisis. And there is another big issue, that's climate change. Climate change is really the next crisis if we don't address it. And it's actually already a crisis in a number of geographies where it's totally changing in a bad way the lives of, of men and women. So the good news, so yes, renewed sense of energy. The good news with the COVID crisis is that we have shown that when people are able to act together, they can have an impact. And that, I think that's a, an important takeaway, and I'm sure we will have to continue in all geographies, we will have to continue in the months to come to act together in, a, in order to be able to both curb the disease and preserve economic activity. So good news is we're able to do so, we're able to change our ways of living. That's exactly what we, we need to do to address the sustainability issue. So yes, renewed sense of energy, and at the same time, renewed signs that we can act together and we are, we're going to move forward and 
it's really also a unique opportunity. When you look at stimulus packages, and there are discussions on both sides of the Atlantic on stimulus packages, it's a unique opportunity to move investments so that our economies, our countries are put on a sustainable path. The path was not sustainable. Climate change was going to be considerable. We have an opportunity with the massive investment plans that are being put in place to move the economies towards sustainability. And maybe a last point that we might come back to this, but I very much agree with what Anne was saying earlier. There is a need for public money, but there is also, and, and even much more, a need for private investments to go towards uh, sustainability and enhancing investments. Doesn't mean that governments don't have a role. I think they have a key role to play in leading these investments, in pricing the carbon, in making sure that green investments are seen as green, as transition, transition investments, which are useful to move to energy transition, are seen as useful transition investments. So a role for public, uh, public policies to guide private investments, but first and foremost, uh, uh, really, really a need for a framework for private investment to move into sustainable investment. Well, let's go, let's go exactly on that line to Anna Finnick and let's go into a bit more detail and a bit more precisely on the importance of the private investment, as of course we've just said, and also I've got a question to you, how also to combine that and how to make sure that we're making the most of the principles of governance in this, in this sense, on this path towards more human and responsible capitalism? Well, I'd say that this has been on display, actually, to sort of uh, play off of what Stefano and Claire have just said. Um, what you're looking at right now is the immediate threat of the pandemic, but the long-term threat of the environment and the environmental issues. And I think we've had a pretty good dress rehearsal here for uh, dealing with problems on a global nature whether and, and the role of, of business because it's the pharmaceutical companies that are developing the vaccines. It's companies like Walgreens and CVS and other health distribution outlets that will provide the, uh, you know, the retail sort of vaccination itself. Uh, supply chain management of PPE equipment. Uh, the responsible action of employees, employers toward their employees. Uh, these are to me, just an acute phase of a longer term uh, set of goals and behaviors that we're going to have to put on full display over time to, to improve uh, what we're doing from a climate perspective, but also climate in the sense of the kind of places we work and live. So again, speaking to um, health benefits, to equality, men, women, people of color. And of course, this has been exacerbated in the U.S. There's another dimension uh, here in the U.S., which is the um, the struggle for racial justice, the the uh, un, the uh, murders of uh, George, George Floyd and Breonna uh, Taylor and others that that have brought to the fore in the U.S. during a presidential election, a very acute set of issues. So we are dealing with many things at the same time, the pandemic, the longer term issues of uh, the environment and a very immediate issue of uh, racial injustice in the U.S. And unfortunately or fortunately, we must be able to deal with all of them simultaneously. And that means that you had to be ready. You have to have an employee base that's ready. You have to have a company that is uh acting responsibly and as a citizen of the world. And I do think, uh, as we're seeing out of the EU and the UK, and I think soon out of the US, there will be a fair amount of uh, regulation, legislation, then regulation, that will uh, crystallize the behavior that everyone will be uh, required to demonstrate. And what's your take on the possible on these regulations? Would that be rather a driver or rather an obstacle in some senses for some businesses? Because of course we are talking about the whole spectrum. 
companies operate in different uh, in different areas and also bigger companies or smaller companies. In some cases, I'm being the devil's advocate here, some companies might say that, you know, with regulation, actually, they might feel a little bit restrained about doing some some other things and finding their own way to what's uh, to what's more responsible capitalism. Uh, well, if, uh, I'll start. I'm sure others have their thoughts. I think for the larger companies, uh, we're well on our way. Uh, so I think the burden has to go to the larger companies first. And uh, honestly, I think some of this um, legislation and regulation, as it, as it is imagined right now, has both the carrot and the stick, meaning incentives uh, for certain behavior. I think we may see some tax benefits, we may see some incentives, uh, more generally speaking. But, you know, as a bank, it's a business opportunity when companies must uh, become carbon neutral and move eventually to net zero. Well, they have to finance to do that. So uh, speaking uh, more selfishly, it's a real opportunity. And, and of course, the outcome will be a, a uh, world that is... Uh, carbon neutral and hopefully uh, eventually net zero. Uh, so I think the burden has to come first to the larger companies uh, because we are the ones that can can take on that burden and, and I think others will follow. I, I, we don't want people uh, so regulated that they feel so constrained that they can't do anything, but I just don't see that that's the, the nature of what I see out of the EU Green Deal or what we've just heard from the UK in broad strokes or even what I think will come out of the U.S. Uh, in this uh, future administration. Thank you very much. Uh, Benoît Cocard, CEO at Le Grand, uh, would like to ask you the same question on the importance of regulations and legislation, rather drivers or obstacles. What's your take on that? Because you've mentioned during previously, when you spoke a couple of minutes before, you also mentioned some set of rules and the way things work in your company and the way they have been working for a long while. What's your take on when it comes to uh, national and EU level uh, regulations? Well, it's a broad question, but I would say that uh, regulation is broadly positive in, the, in, the, in this matter. And uh, we can take a few examples um, without the so-called uh, Zimmerman uh, um, um, you know, rule in France, which uh, uh, impose the board, each board to have at least 40% of ladies, of ladies or 40% of men, actually, uh, as board members, it's highly unlikely that the composition of the boards in France would have changed the way it has changed. So, so regulations is, is broad, broadly good. And we could say the same for GDPR, for example. But it's not uh, purely ESG related. Uh, GDPR was first seen as a constraint by many European companies, but I think that it's a, it's a great move and it's a very modern uh, framework. And a lot of uh, uh, countries will adopt GDPR-like regulations because people want to be increasingly protected in their, in their private life. Now, this being said, I also very much believe that it's now time for all the stakeholders to take the lead on the ESG-related topics. And uh, corporates should uh, uh, improve themselves, not because they are pushed by the regulation, but because they are pushed by their people, their employees. This is what Claire was saying about uh, NG uh, getting more uh, um, uh, people applying for a job uh, now that it is seen as a, as a corporate um, and a responsible uh, company by its customers. And we have an increasing number of customers asking us uh, or ranking us in our um, um, uh, ESG uh, uh, metrics uh, by shareholders, uh, of course, which are increasingly uh, active uh, and vigilant on the fact that corporates are, are, are acting uh, well on, on this front uh, by policymakers and so on. So I think that uh, um, uh, regulations are broadly good, but uh, as far as Le Grand is concerned, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, it's more now the influence of uh, uh, people, customers, shareholders and other stakeholders which are, uh, which are motivating us more than the regulations. So they're motivating, and in some cases, in this case, the motivation and even some pressure coming from people could be as yeah. much and as big as our uh, government's it, regulation. Or it could even be bigger. Um, and uh, it is true that now when you want to hire 
um, a young person, 25 or 30 years old person. Um, of course, he's looking at the, the solidity of the company. He wants to make sure that he's working for a company uh, which is sustainable and which will be there in, in a couple of years for the financial results, um, uh, for the corporate culture, for the management, for the board, but uh, he's also looking uh, whether uh, or not the company is doing uh, uh, some, some good stuff for the planet, uh, for the environment, for the communities. And it will become increasingly important post-COVID. I was struck by the fact that, um, you know, I, I went through the 2008-2009 crisis and it was a liquidity crisis. So all stakeholders were wondering, do you have enough cash to be there in three months or six months time? Uh, even though Le Grand is a very um, a sound and solid company. Um, this COVID-19 uh, crisis is very different. Uh, the question which arose uh, um, um, uh, in, uh, in March or April were not liquidity questions, were what, um, as a company, are you doing to protect your people? And what as a, co as a company are you doing to help your communities to go through this crisis? So um, this COVID-19 crisis has been, uh, I think, a, a fantastic, uh, if I may say, uh, accelerator um, of um, of this um, um, awareness uh, that corporates were here not only to make profit and to grow, but also to make some good for the planet and for the people. Uh, Pierre Wissant, I would like to get your view on that because, of course, when it comes to Angie, you've got a lot to say as well and when it comes to regulations, but also on the importance and the, uh, the massive push and drive from active civil society as well. Indeed, uh, regulation is important, public action is important, and sending the right signal is important, uh, but at the same time, uh, and at the same time, not at, but, and at the same time, uh, the pressure that comes every day from customers, from uh, employees, from investors is, is certainly key in uh, helping us move in the right direction. Um, I, I wanted to come back to an issue which was raised by Anne, uh, who said very rightly that uh, large companies have a special responsibility, and I think. This was very true in the COVID crisis vis-à-vis -vis the community where we, were, where we are operating, and this is very true in putting in place a sustainable framework. Uh, I would add to this that uh, similarly, large countries, large economic areas of the world have a specific responsibility. And we were talking before about the actions put in place in the EU I very much look forward having a large number of countries on both sides of the Atlantic embracing climate change issues and sending the right signal because I think it's important to both to drive investment towards energy transition and it's also very important uh, when we think of business in terms of level playing field. For, for large companies, it's very difficult to operate under rules that may be different in one large economy and in another one on, on such things such as the importance of climate change, carbon pricing. So I think it's very important, very key, just as it was key in the COVID crisis to be able to move in the right direction together. I think it will be even more important for global, global climate change that large countries and large companies with them embrace energy transition together. Thank you. And uh, Stefano Pessina, just very briefly, you've been at the forefront, of course, as you said, and as we all know, of this massive and extraordinary situation and crisis in all senses over the past few months that totally overshadowed so many other things this year. What's your take on the position of bigger companies taking bigger responsibilities and facing that? Just briefly, please. Uh, but of course, uh, this is one uh, of the opportunities and of the duty of all the chief executives of the big company. And what I have seen is that uh, the chief executive of the big company were always talking about sustainability, about uh, uh, reducing inequalities uh, and all this stuff. And, main, uh, and in the past, uh, many of them uh, were just doing a good, uh, good PR. PR. They were not acting as they were speaking. But now I have seen that uh, in most, in most, uh, in not all, most companies, uh, uh, it's uh, the element, uh, uh, what the element which is prevailing 
is uh, uh, is uh, to do to try to do the right things and to contribute a change uh, uh, ch to contribute to change our our it's clearly a trend clearly regulations are important but uh, the pressure from the customers and the responsibility of uh, uh, the top guys uh, in the corporation is uh, even more important Thank you so much to all the speakers uh, for this very interesting conversation. It's been great discussing this with, with you, and it's uh, it's great to go, you know, to wrap this panel with the takeaway of uh, when it comes to importance of purpose and a more human and responsible capitalism. It's a big combination of different factors of circumstances, of the right amount of regulations, just the right amount of incentives, and in lots of cases, good amount of pressure, but a good pressure from people, from societies, and so on. Thank you so much for this panel.